You go War that. mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't. I don't think I'm ever gonna top. Why would? Do you want? I don't think I'm ever gonna top it. I'm never gonna top <laughs> it. I'm just glad they'll never have to see it. No, they won't. Hello and welcome back again to War Mysteries. I'm joined ever presently by Matt. Hello. And uh, I'm Jay. In this episode, we're looking into a strange disappearance, perhaps one of the most famous people in history. On the 14th of October, 1913, a body washed ashore on Volkeren Island, uh, which was a region in the Dutch province of Zeeland at the time. The bloated corpse was completely unrecognizable to those who discovered it, but it bore a large wound in the back of the head. Various recovered personal effects that were found on the body were examined, and the body was formally but doubtfully identified to be that of Rudolf Diesel, the inventor of the diesel engine. Puzzlingly, his wife Martha uh, had received a letter just days earlier, apparently from Diesel himself, announcing a successful voyage to Great Britain on board the SS Dresden which was a Great Eastern Railway steamship. Even stranger than this, however, Diesel's name was not on the passenger manifest. Was the body of the inventor found in the sea? And if not, what happened to him? This is the unsolved disappearance of Rudolf Diesel. seriousness as we are going be careful because that uh, v2 is facing towards us but any substantial movement... it's a v2 so pretext i've got i have a there, there is a picture oh well, obviously we'll, uh, we'll indulge we'll our viewers in some quality jpeg imagery there he is that's the boy isn't it? that's the boy. boy so he invented the diesel engine in uh, the sort of 1890s it was born in paris in 1858, I believe. Um, German parents? Uh, yes, yeah, German parents. Oh, Bavarian. It says German there. Yeah, that's, that's old, this is new. As in, this is research, that's dog shit. So, he invented the diesel engine. And did that uh, come before the petrol engine? No. The internal combustion engine was invented in the 1860s oh. by uh, four separate people. Was it petrol? Gasoline, yeah. But the, the idea of the diesel engine was that it didn't involve carburation. Well, not in the traditional sense, anyway. It involved injection. So he invented the injection combustion engine, which used air assistance. And you could use that in vehicles and submarines and everything? Well, at the time, submarines and uh, agricultural machinery. Off, Tractors. Yeah, off-highway kind of equipment. Okay. Um, That's a pretty good invention, then. Yeah, so grain mills would use them. And importantly, he invented this in what year? 1897 is the year that the 250-400 engine was produced. That's the one that you can see in, it, um, in the museum now. 250 being the bore, 400 millimetre stroke. So have it's you, the 250 400. Have you been to the museum to see? I haven't, because I've not gone there. You never do these things. COVID. Do you? I think it's COVID. Yeah. Um, I'll show you a picture of some stuff. So he went, he sailed on board the SS Dresden which was a steamship, that's the boat. That was built in 1896, I believe. It's big, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's a steamship. Two decks, uh, and that sailed regularly from Antwerp to Felistow. And he was on that? He was on board that one evening in 1913. Okay. I think. Is that when he invented the diesel engine? No, that was in 1897. Right. Well, that's when it worked. For the first time. One of them actually blew up and nearly killed him. In his garage, was it? Like Microsoft. Dangerous hobby. Like Microsoft. Didn't the computer blow up and nearly kill Bill Gates? I don't think so. Oh. Maybe. maybe, maybe it did. Bill Gates, if you're out there, let us know what happened. Anyway, got the route here. So there's Antwerp, so you'd go down the canal, past Midlerberg. On this boat? On that boat, from there, to there, which is obviously... Um, why, are we, why have we gone... He invented the engine, right? And now we're talking about him being on a boat. Well, this is this is where he disappeared. Ah, uh, uh, 
Okay, he went missing. He went missing. Yeah, 1930. We're going to get into all that. All right. So uh, let's start with our background. Why not? Rudolf Christian Karl Diesel was born to Bavarian parents in Paris, France, on the 18th of March, 1858. The Franco-Prussian War of 1870 forced the Diesel family to move to London, England, where he would learn English. At age 12, however, Rudolf was sent to live with an aunt in Augsburg, so that he might also learn the German language. Education in engineering began at the Royal Bavarian Polytechnic Institute in Munich, having received a scholarship to study there. By 1879, he had been unable to graduate with his class as he had fallen ill with typhoid fever. That's a shame. No, it's, not, it's not your regular illness that you get while you're at university. Probably was back then. Eight, well, yeah, 1879. Thought typhoid was supposed to be fatal. Or maybe not fatal. Not good for you, is it? Yeah, not, not good for you in 1879. I'm guessing he survived it. He did. Might have wished he hadn't. While waiting for the next examination date, he would gain engineering experience at the Salzer Brothers Machine Works in Switzerland. By 1883, he had gained multiple patents under Carl von Lind, a refrigeration engineer, and throughout the 1880s and 1890s, continued to work towards his goal of perfecting a combustion engine that did not require steam power. 1897 saw the fruition of his labours, the first diesel combustion engine. So that was the main impetus really. Steam engines were high pressure, heavy, difficult to manufacture. Need a lot of coal. Oh. Yeah, mainly used in locomotives, expensive. Dangerous. But a steam engine, of course, you know, we, we shouldn't uh, go down the road of putting it down at all. It was it made the Industrial Revolution possible, so it's very important, the steam. Yeah, it had its day. It obviously is more ideal not to have coal-powered submarines. At the time, obviously, the well, even around 1900, the Royal Navy, it's the largest navy in the world, most powerful armada in the world, and the German nation as a whole was gearing up to better defend itself at sea, shall we say. It was called the uh, Tirpitz Plan. Tirpitz being a Grand Admiral who wanted to build a bigger navy. This motor became the basis upon which all further liquid-fueled diesel engines would develop, the genesis of the modern diesel combustion engine. This marvel of engineering would bring great fortune to diesel, but may also have been the harbinger of his doom. Unfortunately for Diesel, authorities in Germany informed him that an old Prussian law bound him as a subject of the German Emperor and required him to offer any invention of military or naval value to the German authorities for first refusal. He was further told that he could face charges of high treason should he refuse to do so. Diesel did indeed refuse, stating that these were his inventions and he was protected by his patents, preferring instead to make the designs available to everyone who could pay his reasonable royalty fee. It was shortly before the outbreak of World War I that he embarked upon a journey that would be his last, before disappearing from history. So he invented this stable, functional engine. In his shed. Pretty much in his shed. How did they find out then? Well, it's Germany, isn't it? With spy networks and all that everywhere. He probably blagged about it as well on Instagram. So they want it now. So the German authorities, they wanted this invention. Um, because the, Essentially because of the Tirpitz plan, they wanted to build better, more efficient engines for their submarines. So they weren't necessarily completely nefarious reasons for them to want it. Military application, but also, I mean, it could, uh, you know, help improve efficiency, help the economy. I mean, in any case, he, he refused. So anybody that can afford it, they, they're going to have it. And, and they didn't like that. So. Well, it's not a great time to be inventing stuff, is it really? No. 
Not really. All right. Are we? I think. Are they gonna? Are you gonna add these to the? Yeah, we'll bang them out. Are these available to buy? Are we gonna? Are we started doing that yet? No, we're not doing no, that. You promised me. Yeah, we'll be doing I that. didn't. I didn't promise. I, I, I didn't promise anything. I made a lot of promises. I followed up on it. Never mind. Anyway, so. I can't have something to do. I haven't even done anything to do. Well, that's, that was an error. Nazi gold. <laughs> <clears throat> so, he goes out of his way, invents this fantastic engine, builds upon it, makes it better, improves upon it, and then all of a sudden he's got, you know, German authorities knocking on his door. Come on. You know, okay. We know what you've been doing in there. And he said no. He said no. And then what happened? He went on already. He made a clandestine meeting with an engineering firm that was in London and he rather foolishly told a lot of people that he was going. That was silly. Yeah, in public cafes and things. He That's was talking more silly. He was talking to people, saying that he was going to England to share his inventions. Anyway, we'll move on now to what happened on the night that he disappeared. On the evening of September 29th, 1913, the British GER steamship SS Dresden was at sea, having left Antwerp in Belgium, and was bound for port at Harwick in Essex, Great Britain. Among the guests on board were Rudolf Liesel, Herr Luckman, a business partner and fellow engineer, and George Carrells, who managed the diesel factory in Gent also in Belgium. Diesel was on his way to Britain for a number of appointments, including a meeting in London with the Consolidated Diesel Manufacturing Company and the inauguration of a manufacturing plant in Ipswich. Oh, but why haven't... So he's invented a diesel engine, what, and they haven't got one. They've probably bought patents from him before. Remember, remember that we're now oh, 16 yeah. years on. Yeah, he's already made a killing. He's made a killing. So the theoretically, it could just be the three of them on the boat. No, there's... A lot of people on the boat. Mm. It's, a, it's a nightly journey. It goes from Antwerp to Harwick or Felixstowe and then back. How do you know? Because that's what it did. Oh. I've got the I've got the Lloyd's shipping register in. Well, the whole thing. Hang on, let me show you Lloyd's shipping register. There it would go. be interesting to see that, actually. There you go. Where is it? SS, there it is. Dresden steamer. Not do you think uh, I need really a remember. bit of powder? A bit of um, blusher or something? No. I'm gonna get makeup down. Wait, there isn't a mate. There is. I'm not doing up enough, am I? I did do my hair, but I'm gonna make makeup. I'm gonna get a bit of powder on. We haven't got a makeup. We have got makeup. Who's makeup? The makeup department. Yeah, just did just on the just on the nose. What's under, under who is who? What's going on? Thank you. Who's got, that person? Uh, lips or something like a um. Cheers. I sometimes <laughs> use these on set anyway. Who's that? It's makeup, I told you. We haven't got makeup. makeup, who's that? Thanks, Have we got to get in? I've booked makeup for the last three episodes. How can you not have noticed? Makeup. No, you didn't need blusher, would be my answer, by the way. Well, I've got it on now. Right, well, I'll give you the Lloyd Chicken Register back then. It is also thought possible that he planned for a secret meeting with Admiral John Fisher, a keen proponent of the diesel engine, specifically its suitability for military submarines. Diesel's latest designs might have given the Royal Navy a further edge in future sea warfare, and if Diesel was in contact with the British War Department, he may have planned to offer his technology to them. So he's going over there to meet these lads with all of his, you know, clan business acumen, essentially to offer his designs in, in a closeted way to the Royal Navy. And a, new powerful diesel engine would be an advantage and he's told everyone in the village he's, in fact he's told a lot of people that he was unhappy as well because he's been pressured by the government to give his designs up that he said basically no sod off told everyone at the post office down at the pub the cafe cafe banging on about it at the covered market so now everybody <laughs> knows and somehow i'm guessing the german government sniffed it they've 
They've got wind. Yeah, it's a mystery solving. They got on the boat and did him in with a hammer or something, I'm guessing. Oh, we'll find out. It'll be better. After dining together in the ship restaurant, Carells, Luckman and Diesel retired, with both other men noting that Rudolph bid them good night before heading to his cabin, number 18, where he requested a wake-up call of 6.15am from one of the ship's stewards. He was not seen alive again. Upon searching the cabin in the morning, the bed had not been slept in, Diesel's pyjamas were neatly folded, and his watch lay next to the bed. His diary was discovered with an X marked on the date of September 29th. Almost two weeks passed. A corpse was eventually discovered afloat off the coast of Norway in the North Sea by the Dutch vessel Kurtzen, and it was unrecognisable. Personal effects found on the body belonged to Rudolf Diesel, but identification was impossible. As a result, the boat crew held on to the effects to return to the authorities and tossed the body back into the sea. But identification was impossible um, because of the bloating. I know the, the seagulls would have been... Well, uh, yeah, I discovered, I had a look online a bit, of, I did a bit of reading on what happens to a body in water. It gets wet. Well, they don't immediately um, sink. Oh no, you float inbound, don't you? Yeah, you float for a while uh, because the lungs retain that's some why air. The, that's why the mob tie a jack to your leg. Yeah. And then I'm guessing you, you slowly decompose but eventually come back up a bit. Well, water saturation obviously makes you prune up, then the skin begins to split, and then obviously you... you yeah. Not very nice, really. You fall apart in the end, essentially. Um, right. But he still managed to add his watch on still, I'm guessing. Well, personal effects. I can't find out what personal effects they are. I'm guessing the convenient ones, like driver's licence, wallet with his ID in it, you know, a bill, a telephone bill with his favourite teddy. teddy. His favourite teddy. <laughs> you know, things like that, glasses with RD put on them or something ridiculous like that. So anyway, they couldn't identify the body, and so they did the sensible thing and uh, threw it back into the sea. That's what I'd do. Probably wouldn't have even run it out. Dead body, got some nice shit on it. Rolex. Yeah, bollocks. <clears throat> Get right. that. So they didn't really... Uh... Didn't do much. They held on to the effect. Of course they did. Of course they did. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Rudolf Diesel, I've heard of him. It was again discovered floating in the mouth of the Scheldt estuary by an independent boatman days later. But poor weather conditions forced him to once again drop the body back into the water. The corpse would make landfall on October 14th, 1913, when it washed ashore on Volkeren Island. From here, once discovered by the locals, the body was transferred to the mortuary at Antwerp, where finally it was rather doubtfully identified by Diesel's son. Oh, this is ridiculous. What is going on? <laughs> Why get it out? What's this? And then oh, God. It and then put it back in. Oh, yeah. it back oh the in? weather's terrible. Get rid. Why put it back in? Just put it in, leave it on the deck. It's been in the water for in. weeks. At this why point. did they get it out then? I can understand why the first lot got it out. It had With a Rolex them. on it. <laughs> but what I can't understand is why these independent boatmen went to the trouble of getting it out. One of his shoes discovered by the locals. The body was transferred to a mortuary at Antwerp. So he ended up back in Antwerp anyway, where it was uh, rather doubtfully identified by Diesel's son. Uh -huh. Is that your dad? Not sure. Well, I'm going to struggle with this. Probably walk in. <laughs> Is that your dad? Well, <laughs> do you tell me? <laughs> maybe. He did fall over once and drop a bowl of stroganoff all over him and over his face. <laughs> it, it looked sort of like that. But no, otherwise I'm not. The body showed a wound to the back of the head, which it was thought may have been caused by blunt force injury, perhaps intentional, perhaps accidental. It was never ascertained which. Okay. Other sources say he was shot in the head. Was there a bullet in his head? No. I suppose that would have took that That out. would have been handy to have had. Anyway, so that's what basically happened. He got on this boat uh, from Antwerp to Harwick or Felixstowe area with his lads. Had a bit of dinner, maybe a, maybe a few sups. 
went back to bed, wasn't in his room in the morning, uh, essentially it was just gone from the boat the next day. Annoyed the bellboy because he was on the phone ringing him for 20 minutes. <laughs> Why you you twat? So now it's probably time that we move on to uh, the theories. So the first theory is the more common of the four that we're going to be looking into, and that is that he committed suicide. The officially registered cause of death was suicide. There seemed at least on the face of it, to be plenty of evidence to support such a verdict at the time. Esau, contrary to popular belief, was heavily in debt. A figure of 350,000 Deutschmarks appears in various records, that he owed to a number of banks, despite the many licenses held for his engines, though this cannot be confirmed. Additionally, he was reportedly prone to mood swings and depression, largely thanks to many poor investments he had made in oil concerns and property. His mindset would also likely have been influenced by the pressures being exerted upon him by German authorities. As previously mentioned, the Kaiserliche Marine, in particular, were especially interested in keeping Diesel's engine designs exclusive for their use, and made many efforts to force Diesel to adhere to these conditions something he was adamantly against. So they were still after him for his engines. Uh, you know, leaning on him. Turned him down, didn't he? He did. He told him to sling the hook. A protracted legal dispute had also taken its toll on the inventor, as Ackroyd Stewart, an English inventor and engineer, had brought a case against Diesel for plagiarising his work regarding the combustion engine and in fact had evidence to back his claims that he had in fact conceived the idea. On board the SS Dresden, Diesel's shoes and coat were found neatly placed besides a safety railing, for no apparent reason. And finally, the cross drawn in his diary against 29th of September, the day he vanished, was thought to indicate a planned disappearance, and likely a suicide. Any Columbo, really, I think, for this one, don't we? Columbo? Yeah. What, that bloke who wears the Mac? Yeah. Or that old bat from Murder, she wrote. <laughs> the cross drawn in his diary against the 29th of September was thought to indicate a planned disappearance, which could have been suicide. People don't normally... They're not really normally that cryptic, though, are they? Well, really? yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, they are. They can be. If, if somebody decides that they want to... Suicide, I believe is the PC term. We don't put um, it as a definite article. Um, they they may go about planning it down to a very fine detail and will choose what they do and don't leave. But then there would also possibly have been indications before he left, which I'm guessing they'll have to ask people. When he was running around town shouting about his engines, yeah. or did he, was he naked? You know, was he showing, was he a bit, being a bit different to normal? <laughs> I think suicide is sounding. Is there much more information? No, that's about on? it, really, to be honest. So. That was where we're at. That was where we, they found him like that. Oh. Well, they did, well, they did, they just found him in the sea. The problem is, it sounds like most of the things that they. Like the clothes being folded up, the bed not being slept in, and yeah. that, that sort of. You could set that up. So. Yeah, that's true. So that's the first theory. Maybe he uh, did himself in. Seems like a bit of a harsh way to go. No one heard a gunshot. Or at least not that's been reported. Back of his head as well, isn't it? Uh, well, if you shot yourself in the front of the head, that'd be the bigger of the wound. Oh, no, he didn't have much. The sea. There was no left, was there? The fish sort of going at you. A bit of brain matter. Probably had a barnacle on him. Ugh. So, the second theory then is that he suffered an accidental death. The evidence surrounding this theory primarily revolves around the evening meal that Diesel had attended with Luckman and Carrolls. The fact that alcohol was involved, coupled with Diesel's probable mindset at the time, 
that he was heading to the UK to sell designs to the Royal Navy and therefore directly opposing his own government, would likely have weighed heavily upon him. Do you want some Nazi gold? Do I want some Nazi gold? <laughs> some, these, they, they actually say gold. There's no swastikas on them. Uh, yeah, that's some Nazi gold. I'll have one as well. There aren't any for our viewers, I'm afraid. Tastes kind of worm acty. They're lovely, they're golden. Mmm. Mmm. Got a real Eastern Front vibe to it. The idea that someone might simply disappear at sea is not without precedent, even in the same decade. In 1912, Russian Arctic explorer Alexander Kuchin was lost on the Kara Sea, never to be seen again. In mid-August of 1914, famed Swedish chemist, engineer and industrialist Albert Johan Pettersson completely disappeared from the steamer DS Ullensvang while crossing a ford to Bergen. And Marie Empress, a famous British silent film actress, vanished from stateroom 480 the night before the SS Orduna docked in New York City in 1919. If Diesel did indeed fall from the ship and sustained the head injury found on the body in the process, he would likely have been unconscious upon entering the water, where he would quickly have drowned. Well, it's a big place to see, isn't it? It is quite big. So people disappeared at sea throughout that decade. A lot. Famous yes, people. Still do now. Just, like, never found nothing. It's a good place to get somebody on a boat, isn't it? Back then, before CCTV cameras. Assuming Columbo is not on board, obviously. I don't know, I mean, accidental death, maybe. Well, if he fell from the ship and sustained a head injury, which was found on his body, he might have drowned. Why the folded up clothes? That's the question. Perhaps he was getting ready for bed, and he did what you do at night, and went out to the rails to urinate. Theory number three, then, is that he voluntarily disappeared. Sorry, Jesus. A bit of Barbarossa in my teeth. This less popular theory surmises that Diesel simply wished to escape his debts. His financial situation was becoming more widely understood by the time of his disappearance, and as later discovered, he left almost his entire remaining fortune to his wife having essentially emptied his accounts. An article emerged, hidden away in the small print of continental newspapers, that mentioned an unidentified man scrambling ashore, just as the SS Dresden steamer made its way from the berth at Antwerp out to the open sea. This tiny nugget of information, though unsubstantiated, may well be proof of his intent to vanish, but a number of questions remain. Why would he abandon his wife? Why would he also abandon his inventions and fortune? And if he intended to make it seem as though he boarded a boat and disappeared en route, why was he not listed on the passenger manifest? I might just thought to check him in. Maybe, but he's quite a famous guy. It's not like um, you, know, you or me getting onto what, QE2 or whatever. Hang on a minute. You know, I've got... I've had See, I've had special seats reserved in restaurants off the back of War Mysteries, I think. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't. Yeah, not really, not really a fan of that one. It doesn't, no, I don't think so, not necessarily, no. I think it sounds good to start with, but um, when you lay it out like you did there, Which it just doesn't, doesn't make, make any sense. sense. Yeah, it doesn't make no. sense. But he had a lot of money, maybe not a millionaire, but he had a lot of money, an awful lot of money. He probably would have been a millionaire eventually. He invented this engine, had a lot of prowess, a lot of pull in the engineering world. Got a wife. Kids? Yeah, he had a son. I don't know if he had any other children. Should we wipe that one out? Wipe that one out. That's That's correct. Correct. So let's do the new theory number three. His theory number three is murder. Perhaps 
perhaps the most in-depth of the prevailing theories is that Rudolf Diesel was murdered. In simple terms, Diesel was offering his inventions to foreign agencies, such as the British Navy, on open license to whoever could afford them. And this was a cause for great concern for a number of different organisations, mainly coal industrialist groups who stood to lose a large market share at the advent of the diesel engine. Separately, other potential suspects included mainly business rivals, but most notably the German Secret Service, known then as Section 3B, who are forerunners in the likely list of instigators. Shortly after Diesel's disappearance, this secretive unit was upgraded to a full department, becoming the Abteilung 3B, and was a frighteningly efficient machine. It's harsh, isn't it? It is a bit harsh, but that's what the industrialist German authorities were like. They wanted to keep his technology and the potential of that technology within Germany. I suppose it's a bit like the uh, race to get build the atomic bomb during the Second World War. Americans got there first, in theory. Oh, we know about um, that, don't we? We do. Tensions had been rising between Britain and Germany for more than a decade leading up to the First World War, especially with regard to naval power. The near culmination of the Tirpitz plan had practically ensured this, and following this thought process, newspapers at the time reported that Diesel may well have been assassinated by an agent of the German government. For the perceived crimes of sharing technology with other countries, and disregarding previous demands to limit diesel engine development within German borders. Finally, the head wound found on the corpse was identified during the autopsy as having been caused before death, and therefore lends credence to the assassination theory. But it still doesn't rule out the fact that he might have just smashed his head on something on the way down, if he was pushed or jumped off the boat. But you've seen the boat. You know, it's not like the Titanic, you're not 60 floors above the ground. It's not like the Titanic, no, but it is big. Which is why it surprises me. But jumping off of it. that, jumping off that ain't gonna kill you, is it? There's a rowing boat next to it. Look. You can see the size of it. There's the lifeboats. So, jumping from that is probably not gonna kill you. But if you smashed your head on something on the way down, <laughs> then you might have um, piss it. <laughs> mm, well... Oh. So I just can't see it. A 1963 newspaper article made reference to a chance meeting by the editor, George Minto, with an elderly German national in a Geneva bookstore, sometime in the 1950s. Upon discussing the events before World War II and the German Secret Service, the subject of Diesel came up. Ah yes, a clever fellow, but rather a nuisance towards the end. We had to get rid of him. The German was not seen again, having presumably left town shortly after. It's quite carbon heavy. There it is. All mysteries. Carbon heavy. That's the, that is the article. This is the one holdover from that time. You know, obviously it's 50 years later. This guy would have been in his late 70s, 80s by the time mm -hmm. he met him in this bookstore. I believe that an agent of the German Secret Service was aboard the Dresden that night and murdered the doctor in his cabin pushing the body through the porthole into the sea. When I was in Portholes Geneva, are only about that big. No, 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 I'm well, back then. Why would you push him out the window for? <clears throat> well, you, well, kill him in his room and push him out the window. There he is. Yeah, you can see him there. On the side of the boat. Uh, maybe maybe they're big enough. Yeah, I'm could assuming... We, could we get him through one of them? Well, I'm assuming that these white blobs in this picture are people. I, I haven't got a clue. Because the picture looks like it was taken with a potato. I mean, I was uh, going to kind of be erring towards murder. I think, so, um, given the political situation at the time and what was going on, that, yeah, I think you're probably on the right track there. So might actually solve this one. It just seems to be more pointing towards him being killed. Like, his name wasn't on the uh, passenger manifest. It wouldn't be beyond their power to have removed it. Rubbed it out. Rubbed it out. So they'd say, well, he wasn't on that boat, so how could he have died? The letter that he sent to his wife 
he left instructions for her not to open it until a week after she received it. And she didn't open it for a week? No. So he left it with her, and by the time she opened it, it was dead. I would have opened it open. Would you? I'd have like, if... Why would you do that, though? Why would you leave her all of your assets? He emptied his bank accounts. She was literally given all of his patents and what pretty much what remained of his money. And he said, don't open it for a week. I think you're right. I would probably err on the side of murder. What do you think? Yeah, I'd err on the side of murder. I think that's where we're moving towards here with uh, her diesel. <laughs> so, um... All right, murder it is. You want a longing to cut back, to cut it back. Oh, we just did there. Right. Conclusion! Murder. Jesus. All right, so we pretty much decided he was murdered. All right. You know what comes next? Legacy. The legacy. It's no exaggeration to say that Rudolf Diesel's legacy is colossal. The impact of his inventions and his engineering genius stretches far beyond his era, having laid foundations for the oil and automotive industries that we know today, as well as directly assisting the development of a vast range of military vehicles, from tanks to submarines, trains to battleships. But in harsh contrast, his own life came to an end much more quietly. Diesel continually advocated that his engines and designs would be available to everyone who could pay, so that all nations could benefit from the machines he brought to the world. Noble though it may have been, this gesture likely cost him his life. The Kaiserliche Marine headed by Grand Admiral von Tirpitz, was undergoing aggressive expansion at the time of Diesel's disappearance under the Tirpitz plan, a high-risk effort to increase the size of the German Navy relative to the British, hinging on becoming a large enough opponent that the Royal Navy would be discouraged from direct engagement. This plan naturally would benefit from new technologies, and particularly if those technologies could be obtained exclusively. Diesel's refusal to cooperate would certainly not have been taken lightly by the German authorities of the era. In their eyes, to share technology of such potential with their perceived enemies would have represented a substantial risk to the Tirpitz expansion plan, evening the playing field and denying Germany a strategic advantage in future military and industrial affairs perhaps for decades. However, with conspiracy theories flourishing soon after, the events of the night he disappeared were not fully understood at the time, and sadly, with so much evidence pointing in so many different directions, probably never will be. It's that sort of era, isn't it? Late 1880s, 1890s, everything was happening. Tesla's doing his, you know, experimentation with alternating current. Edison's inventing the bulb. 
or whatever, Louis Le Prince invents the uh, moving image system. Marconi invented radio, all that stuff going on. And this guy obviously invented the uh, diesel engine. The Belle Epoque, as the French called it. The beautiful era. Didn't last very long. War. So that's it. That's it. That is also it for series three, I believe. I don't think what it's the God knows what that was. It, it, it was alive, whatever. Ah, oh, shit! shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It's dead now. It's just there. F***ing <laughs> hell, man. <laughs> I can't hear. <sighs> that was so loud. So that's it. That is the uh, the end of uh, not only this episode, but also finally the end of series three, which means that that concludes our little analysis uh, of World War One, uh, such as it was. Uh, you enjoy it? Yeah, I think I did. There were some interesting ones in World War One. It's been all right. Saw yeah. a submarine again. We've got, a sub, got a sub in there oh. somewhere. But yeah, I have enjoyed series three. Uh, let us know what you thought about the episode. Um, obviously, the comments box down below is always vacant and always available. Obviously, Matt's uh, opinion is obvious. We hope you've enjoyed series three with us. We appreciate it's taken us a long time to get this episode to air. And uh, thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for uh, continuing to support our channel. I'm, uh, I'm off before you get more makeup. Do you disappear frequently? <laughs> <laughs>